Welcome to the second of two special revision webinars focusing on aspects of behavioral economics. In the first webinar, which is available on the YouTube site, we looked at a range of behavioral concepts such as choice architecture, loss aversion, bounded rationality, and so on. And uh, also thought about how economics has moved away from the assumption of, of rational behavior by people towards a kind of new theory of, of economic behavior by agents. In this session, we'll take a look at some examples of behavioral policies in particular, uh, analyze and evaluate the concept of behavioral nudges. It's well known that there are more connections in your brain than there are known stars in the galaxy, something like, something like 100 billion connections. And it's becoming increasingly obvious as we gain more information in, in the areas of, uh, for example, neuroscience, that decision making by individuals is incredibly complicated. It's often little wonder that people rely heavily on rules of thumb and that they often use a set of um, heuristics and, and social norms to drive much of their behaviour. When we come on to nudge in a few minutes, it's really about designing situations when people make uh, the right or perhaps the better choice. But, but keep in mind that uh, value judgments, of course, have to, be, have to be thought about in this situation. And there are issues oftentimes to do with ethical concerns about uh, trying to change people's behaviour in certain ways. The other point uh, I want to make is that behavioural nudges are not new. We've had white lines in the middle of the road for decades to, to nudge people to use the right or the left hand side of the road, depending on where you are and which country you're, you're driving. Nudges are not new. And another really important point is that uh, increasingly we understand that people's behaviour is not taken in isolation. Our brains don't make decisions independently. Often uh, we, we, uh, we, we operate within the context of norms and networks. Policies that change social norms can have very powerful effects, oftentimes uh, very quickly. So this new view of agents takes us away from the idea that agents are perfectly optimizing, maximizing, cold calculating machines, looking to maximize their welfare from every single decision. Instead, behavioral economics in, invites us to think about people who are who have a limited clock speed, limited computational capacity. They're strongly influenced by their own social networks, be they family or community or, or kinship groups of some type. Often they act reciprocally as well as in self-interest. They make decisions lacking self-control and in particular, they tend to be present biased. They think more about the immediate future than the future that lies a long way ahead. We've talked in the previous webinar about people being loss averse. People tend to hate losses more than commensurate gains. And people tend to make different choices and decisions when they're in a, a hot emotional state compared to whether when they're in a cold reasoned state. They fall back on simple rules of thumb in their behavior and they tend to satisfy rather than maximize. And fundamentally, uh, people have a very strong default to maintain the status quo. In other words, they inaction is often the preferred uh, path of choice. So in that context, let's think about uh, some behavioral nudges. Here's a good example. There was an attempt to increase student voter registration at the University of Bangor in Wales. And they sent out two emails to do two different groups. In both cases, the email was bilingual, as is required in Welsh law here. The first email, just a nice simple um, image, become a voter today by clicking here and a click to a, reg a registration site. In the second example, exactly the same image, except they added a picture of the iconic Nelson Mandela. That's an interesting uh, thought experiment as to which of these emails might have been most effective in getting more Bangor University students to register as voters. The instinctive view of many people, if you, if you ask them, is that the second email will be more effective and that will be a nudge to try to increase voter registration. The evidence suggests that actually email two is no more effective than email one. And in many ways, there's a kind of evaluation point here that you, you sometimes want nudges to fail. Living in a world of constant experimentation, constant iteration is a good thing. Uh, as we move towards more evidence-based policies with trials and control groups, this is this is part of the iterative process of working out what works and what doesn't. So presumably they must have had to try a different pathway to increase voter registration. So we talk about behavioural shoves, slightly firmer version of a nudge. Uh, we talk about nudges. Most policy concerns behaviour. Fundamentally, economics, of course, is a social science 
and we're interested in how people behave, we're interested in how people choose, how operate, and the question is whether nudges are effective in changing that behaviour. Some nudges involve the elimination or the restriction of choice. For example, the ban on smoking in public places is quite a, quite a hard nudge, a shove if you like. Likewise, a, a ban or law banning under 18s from using tanning salons officially. Sometimes the government introduces a clear financial incentive to take a, to take a particular course of action. It could be a, a penalty in terms of a higher tax on cigarettes or a plastic bag tax or the, the imminent sugar tax. Or it could be a positive reward, a voucher, for example, for healthy behaviour choices. And then we have a range of nudges which are essentially about influencing the choice in some sense. Uh, better information on menus, design of buildings to encourage healthier behaviour, uh, changing the default on a device, and crucially, perhaps uh, using norms, providing information to people about what other people are choosing to do. Here are some examples of uh, some behavioural nudges in action. The one on the top left, I think, is a, is a significant change in, in, in behavioural design. So in Wales, they've moved towards deemed consent for organ donation. In other words, they're moving, sorry, they're moving towards uh, mandated choice, mandated choice. So if you haven't recorded an organ donation decision, opt in or out out on the, on the NHS organ donation register, then you're in Wales, you're now treated as having no objection to donating any of your organs. So this is called deemed consent or mandated choice. Really good example of a Travel Smart initiative in Singapore, top middle there. If you travel before 7.45am or after 9 o'clock, in other words, if you choose to travel outside of the rush hours, then uh, you get a cheaper fare and also you can uh, you can be handed into a, into a lottery to win some money. Um, chunking is quite an interesting idea. This is, the, this is the way in which we try to get people to complete a course of treatment. Oftentimes people are given, let's say, 15 pills and... Um, and uh, told to take one a day and after a few days they're feeling better and therefore they stop taking their pills and that can lead to all kinds of feedback effects in the long run. Well instead of having 15 orange pills, if you had five white, five orange, five green for example, if you chunk the pills colour it may be more likely that the uh, that consumers would, would complete their course of treatment. Also different ways in which you try to incentivise uh, people's behaviour. So you can have lotteries to encourage weight loss or cut speeding, the famous speedish, sp Swedish speed lottery experiment, if you, if you Google that, uh, where speeding motorists coming into a town were fined, that money went into a lottery pot, and motorists who stayed underneath the speed limit were entered into the lottery to win. Quite a really good example there. Uh, crucially, uh, oh, so back to, back to, back to uh, Singapore, top medal. Co commuters in Singapore who make decongesting trips each week are rewarded. So you can have a chance to win a prize of maybe a dollar or ten dollars or even a hundred dollars as well as a monthly lucky draw. So that's the kind of incentivization thing. Uh, bottom middle there, using simple checklists in hospitals to uh, reduce the number of x-rays. That's a really quite interesting idea. So instead of rushing people to x-ray now, hospitals in many ways like a, an airline approach use a checklist of, of questions for patients. And they find that's much more effective following simple rules of thumb. Uh, they can reduce the number of times that people go to x-ray, which of course is costly to the individual and costly to the hospital. Choice architecture, really quite important. So taking away the meal tray, for example, reduces how much food people eat and lowers the amount of waste in the system. Quite interesting in terms of the NHS, around 10 to 12 percent of hospital appointments are missed. People just don't turn up and again you can try and find ways to minimise this to reduce the the, uh, the waste of people not turning up to appointments in the system, the opportunity cost. Simple things work quite well. For example, an SMS message reminding people and giving a number to ring if you can't make it. Turns out actually the most effective way is the SMS, the text message to, to people to remind them. But also a simple reminder that every cost, uh, every appointment costs around £160 of NHS money. And that's, uh, that behavioural test, that nudge, helped reduce non-attendance by about a quarter. A savvy idea from Beijing to try and encourage recycling when you're at the tube station about to board a train. This is a timely intervention. If you're prepared to recycle your bottle, you can get 50 cents off your train journey or something similar. It's a nice timely nudge. And another good example of a timely nudge is in Scotland, in Dumfries and Galloway, where primary school kids pre-order their foods a week ahead of time from a list of healthy options. This is almost, a, it's both timely, 
It's also in a sense what's called a, a commitment device, which people have committed to a certain meal, which they've chosen from a list. And of course, it helps the schools to minimise waste. They know how much food has been ordered. Another problem is people getting tickets for parking offences and non-payment of car tax and also getting tickets for um, speeding. Oftentimes the standard letter is a penalty notice saying that you have 28 days to pay or you'll be in court. But still people, many people choose not not to pay. Uh, well, there's various nudges you can do to increase repayment rates. Sending a letter, including the picture of the offending vehicle, lifted um, payment rates by nearly 10%. Interestingly, it also sends people sometimes a picture of who's in the car with you, which can be sometimes embarrassing. Potential there for another stronger nudge. And also non-payment of tax. Again, sending reminders to people that they haven't paid their tax. Well, it turns out that uh, if you tell people in the letter that, that most people pay their tax on time, that increase payment rates by a, a non-trivial amount. Uh, but that's not necessarily true for the highest income people. That oftentimes that letter actually reduces payment rates, better to those groups to send them a letter saying exactly how their tax revenues are spent and that sometimes increases repayment rates. I'll come back to the blister pack in a second, that's a really good example of what's called a, a nudge as a result of making uh, a decision more frictional. The Behavioural Insights Unit in the UK have developed a mnemonic for nudging people to change their behaviour and they've come across, the, they've developed the idea of the e, uh, the EAST mnemonic. Um, and this is a quite an interesting idea. So EAST, E-A-S-T, first one is make it easy to change behaviour. So the easiest way is to, is to change the default. So as we mentioned in Wales, the auto-enrolment for organ donation. People opt, opted in at birth and you have to opt out. Simplifying messages on tax returns and things on websites makes it easy. To, to change behaviour. And when it comes to recycling, using very colourful and specialised container lids makes it easy for people to decide where their recycled rubbish goes. Make it easier for people to try to give up smoking. All kinds of different nudges there from tax to regulation to advertising bans. But actually, if you think about the effect of e-cigarettes uh, and vaping, that is, by some consent, actually, the, the most powerful at the moment, the most powerful current way in which people attempt to give up smoking conventional cigarettes. So making e-cigarettes and vaping easier or not putting barriers in the way can be quite substantially effective. Uh, you can either lower the friction cost, make it easier to substitute to a better behaviour, or you can increase the friction cost. The example there is, of course, taking away taking away the tray from, uh, from restaurants. People eat less <coughs> and uh, create less waste as a result. This changing the default is I think quite a significant behavioural idea. So if you get an exam question on behavioural economics, changing the default is very often the most effective way of changing behaviour quite rapidly. Auto-enrolment in savings and pension schemes has become a, has become a mantra in behavioural economics. Auto-enrolment. People enrol automatically into a particular pension scheme or a savings scheme. We'll come back to some data on that in the UK. The default on a printer. Is it, is it defaulted to print on both sides or print on one side? It's an obvious easy way to cut uh, printing costs. In Germany, auto-enrolment in green energy is proven to be more effective than actively choosing green energy. So the default in Germany now, in many parts of Germany, is that people are already into a green energy source. And they have to pay a little bit more, although green energy increasingly taking advantage of economies of scale. People could opt out if they want to pay a little less, but the reality is you don't necessarily have to be a member of the Green Party to stay in, many people choose to, to remain opted in to green energy sources. And Germany, in the European context, is ahead of the game as a, in terms of dominance of, of renewable energy and their energy output. Simple things like changing the default settings on thermometers in heating systems in buildings and households. You know, changing it by just one degree, people barely noticed and cut energy costs as a result. Actually, setting the default two degrees lower did have less effect. People seem to notice that. So changing the default rule is an important nudge. Good example is auto enrolment in October 2012. UK employers, businesses started automatically enrolling their workers into a pension. And the scheme started with the largest employers, 250 people or more. By 2018, it will cover all employers. 
and it seems to have been much more effective than traditional interventions such as the tax or the subsidy. As you can see, there's been a big increase in the number of workers covered by auto enrolment. I mentioned the, the, the frictional effects on blisters. This is really interesting. So they brought in a law several years ago replacing or banning bottles of pills with blistered packages that require a user to open each, each um, unit of a paracetamol or ibuprofen individually. And a study found that deaths from paracetamol poisoning fell by over 40% after the law requiring the bigger portions to be presented in blister packs. Now, in context, that would be something like a, nearly a, just a thousand fewer deaths between 1998 and 2009. It's quite a significant result. Uh, it, it seems to be that the extra effort required to release each pill individually, just that extra effort was enough to discourage the self-harm attempt altogether by many people. So East is make it easy, it also make it attractive. So make it attractive to change behaviour. Instead of isolating vegetarians, make vegetarian food absolutely part of the normal choice architecture of a menu. Don't make it don't make it exceptional, don't make it exclusive, don't highlight it, just, just normalise behaviour. Uh, or put vegetarian food or healthy foods at the top and bottom of, of menus because that has a dis disproportionate effect to what people choose. Incentives can make it attractive to change behaviour. So, for example, the Chinese authorities now print lottery tickets on the back of retail receipts. You get a retail receipt, you enter into a lottery, uh, and that's an attempt to reduce VAT evasion by people refusing to give out receipts at, at shops and things. We talked about uh, commuting in Singapore. Um, you, know, you gain credits in getting online gaming if you travelled at off-peak times. A lot, of, a lot of people want to do that. So make it easy, make it attractive. The, the really important point is about social influence. So social influences matter a lot in terms of our behaviour. We don't take it, decisions in isolation. Uh, some studies have found that, for example, music preferences about the quality of a song are heavily influenced by the quantity of downloads or ratings on into Amazon and Uber. Uh, people's decisions about which hotel chain to use or which airline to use, which resort to go to, strongly influenced by previous reviews on TripAdvisor and so on. Jury decisions influenced by social influences, for example, the views of dominant personalities. Something you may not have come across before is the idea of the Sapir-Whorth hypothesis. And this is the idea that if you create a new language, that can create a new social norm, which then in turn invokes a new style of behaviour. And one of the best examples is that of the designated driver. You know, somebody who willingly accepts the role of designated driver when people are going on an evening out and they don't drink, they stay um, on non-alcoholic drinks for the evening, for that evening. This, this new language, the designated driver, was actually written into film scripts and into TV soap scripts and into radio programmes. And it actually very quickly became an accepted social norm that any given group going out, one person would be the designated driver. And you can make a case for saying this has been a powerful, powerful idea going forward. Uh, social norms matter. So again, trying to get um, trying to get drivers to pay their speeding fines and things and respond to penalty notices. Well, a reminder, uh, how, how the reminder is framed in the context of the social context is really quite important. So this was a trial which is aimed to reduce re-offending and also improve compliance with road traffic penalties amongst those who failed to pay within 28 days. And this letter included a picture of you know flowers, presumably at a site where somebody had died as a result of speeding. And a, a non-trivial increase in, in, re, in repayments from 16.1 to 18.3 and also a fall in the rate of prosecutions thereafter. So some evidence that this kind of social appeal to social norms does work. You know, we're, we're creatures of our environment. And here's a beautiful example from a city I know well. Probably you may recognise the Bourke Street stairs at Southern Cross Railway Station in the, in the fantastic city of Melbourne. There are lifts on the right hand side, lifts on the left hand side if you choose to use the lift. A wide arc of stairways and of course this beautiful colouring in of the stairs did encourage more people to use the stairs. Who wouldn't want to climb up those stairs in that fantastic colouring? Although eventually this was hijacked by a commercial company for advertising purposes which was a little bit of a shame. The other part of uh, East 
easy, attractive, social and timely. So when you intervene in the market, it makes a difference. It does matter when you do things. So prompting people to change their behavior at a particular opportune moment can make nudges more effective. There's some evidence, for example, that people approaching personal landmarks in their lives, 19, 29, 39, 49, 59, oftentimes they are at a sort of punctuation point in their lives and things. They're thinking, what's the next decade going to hold in store for me? And that can be a useful tipping point for a reminder about lifestyle choices. Target anti-smoking campaigns when there's a flu epidemic because more people are aware of the coughing and spluttering around them and uh, more likely to think about their own mortality, I suppose. Offer people the chance to sign up for organ donation when they're renewing their tax, tax disc every year. Just make it simple, make it easy, but make it timely. Choose the moment to intervene. Sometimes, of course, a nudge requires an incentive. And there's no doubt about this. Sometimes people need, especially when there's a strong default, they need an incentive. Here's a good example from Australia. Um, this is a behavioural intervention which uh, used Fitbit devices to monitor how many steps people took and they ran a trial. And they're trying to estimate the effectiveness of incentives to motivate behaviour. For one group, the group in, in the group target in black here, uh, so one group was set a personal target and there was another group where massage vouchers were offered to $50 each as, a, as an incentive. And you can see there was quite a significant effect in terms of offering a massage voucher as increase, people increasing their steps. Sometimes offering this, that combination of technology and incentives can be quite a powerful, powerful uh, intervention. Now, it's important to be able to, to be aware of some of the criticisms of behavioural nudges. And, and uh, some, so let's finish off with some evaluation. Behavioural economics can sometimes give the impression that people are irrational and basically dumb. I think that would be a mistake. But many people live their lives happily um, following basic rules of thumb, basic heuristics. And they don't have to be cold, maximising, rational calculating machines to have a, have a, a, a happy life. It can be very rational and optional, uh, optional, actually, just to follow simple rules of thumb in relationships, in food choices, in choice of holiday location, choice of car, vehicle, whatever it is. Rules of thumb oftentimes work extremely well, particularly in a world of deep complexity. So we shouldn't assume people are being dumb in, in behavioural economics. Some, some argue that nudge theory is, is, is fine when we're trying to change relatively minor behaviours, although that's of course a value judgement, but perhaps less effective at the moment in addressing the deeper societal problems such as you know, alcoholism, drug dependence, street violence, oftentimes across generations. Important to distinguish between softer nudges, changing the choice architecture, changing the layout of a choice, providing better information, and hard nudges, controlling the actual product, a ban or some sort of hard restriction. And that's quite important to make a distinction between the two. In terms of behavioural testing, often in the early years of behavioural economics, we relied on testing people in labs to see how they responded. Um, and you know, try to find out what kind of psychological biases became apparent. But those samples, the samples used in testing might be flawed, particularly if you have a fairly small sample that's mainly white, well-educated, middle-class students. Now, that's not a representative sample, and often people's behaviour in the lab doesn't reflect what they actually do in the real world. I think point five is particularly important that nudges shouldn't be seen in isolation from other forms of intervention. So they can be uh, effective, but taxes, subsidies and regulations are often as effective. I mean, you can make a case for saying double nudges uh, can, can be effective. So changing the choice architecture of sugary drinks in supermarkets is a behavioural nudge, but the sugar tax, which is coming in in 2018, is already causing drinks manufacturers to reformulate their products and cut the amount of sugar in fizzy drinks, for example. And so, you know, choice architecture and the prospect of a tax are having a combined effect on sugar consumption. Uh, do not just sustain or do they sustain or do they, does the impact wear off with time? There's, there's a, some theory that says that nudges may have an initial impact, but actually there could be some diminishing returns to nudge. And that's something to be aware of. And increasingly, of course, we're testing the effectiveness of interventions. 
Randomized control tests aren't perfect either. They can be lengthy, time consuming, as well as expensive. On the other hand, uh, the spread of ubiquitous mobile technology can, can change behavior, the so-called Fitbit effect, that people now have smartphones and they can monitor their health and uh, their calorific con content and diabetics have apps which can monitor what they're eating. <clears throat> people with various conditions can use mobile technology and applications to, uh, to change their behavior. Uh, Fitbit people are obsessed with how many stairs they climb, etc. So there's a make a case for saying that technology is making nudging easier and increasing the effectiveness of that because people are getting real-time information about the, about the impact of their behaviour. But a, a practical barrier worth mentioning is that many of the ideas from behavioural economics aren't necessarily adopted in policy. Sometimes governments don't have um, a lot of, a lot of um, confidence in behavioural economics. Uh, it's certainly gained ground in countries like the UK and in Germany and in Australia and the United States. But in other countries, behavioural economics is yet really to become mainstream government policy. That said, the World Development Report in 2015 did focus on behavioural economics, and it's worth a look at if you want to look at that from a, from a from developing country perspective. And the final point is that the impact of a behavioural nudge is always contextual. So a nudge that works quite well in one country doesn't necessarily work as well in another region or another nation, perhaps at a different stage of development. There's no uniformity in terms of behavioural interventions. That, of course, is true of tax and subsidies and other interventions as well. A reminder that all of our webinars are recorded onto YouTube. So if you want to go through this again and add to your notes and things, lots of longer and shorter form versions of our webinars, hundreds of economics videos are available now on the YouTube site. So please do take a look. Just go to YouTube and type in tutor to you so thank you for, for joining me on this uh, this uh, second webinar. Paul Omod said that an economist can no longer be said to have a good training in economics if he or she is not familiar with the main themes of behavioural economics and the strengths and weaknesses of the approach. And I hope over the last two webinars we've covered quite a lot of ground and you've learnt quite a bit. Thank you and uh, see you again sometime soon.